All right then. Things uh levels are good on your end. Oh yeah, yeah, they're good. I hope. All right, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna make sure our audience can hear hear us for the for uh this episode. Yeah, this time and, I I'm literally eating the mic right now. I hope not literally. I hope not literally. It's not good for you, man. <laughs> hey, it gives me some extra iron in there. You're gonna be, you're gonna be like that, uh, uh, that one chick in that Djibouti video. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Wait, which one? Which one? Uh, the, uh, the one with uh Peter Popov, the very first one, the motivational speaker one. Uh, I don't remember that one. Well, the main thing is, is that there was literally uh. They dubbed up this woman who had like these really messed up teeth, and they're pretty much dubbing over her how that if they don't take the microphone out out, out of her mouth, that she's gonna eat that thing because she loves eating metals. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome welcome back to the Hatch Jack Show, episode two. Uh, I am Hack, and I am Jack. Are, that is right. And actually, we we got some updates on on Jackson. So, if for the few of you that listened to the last podcast, I, I've mentioned that Jack would never do anything weird with his Lalafell and FF14. <laughs> a few days a few days ago, maybe yesterday, uh, probably <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, he messaged me saying that he changed classes uh, for his Lalafell. Initially, he was a red mage. Is that correct? Red mage? Uh, red mage and black mage. Yeah, so pretty much uh, just spell casting. I was like, okay, maybe he'll want to be a white mage. Maybe he might do... D- uh, was it uh, DSP, right? No, DPS. I'm sorry. Not yeah. DSP. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's something else Damn entirely. Damn second per. <laughs> No, that's a, that, no, I'm talking about the other DSP. Any case, oh. There. Um, but no, he changed his, his Lala fell to Exotic Dancer, which led me to <laughs> led me to joke that, you know, his Lala fell is going through hard times. You know, he's got to get the new armor set, but it's, it's, a lim- it's a limited edition armor set, so he's got to make the mu- he's got to make the gill somehow. And <laughs> poor poor Jack, where you're making that Lollafell go through, man? Hey, hey, uh, what pretty much happened in there was I was going through a city and the newest expansion, and someone out of nowhere starts saying, "Hey, everyone, get to the sc- uh, go and get to the strip club right now." So I go in there and I see two muscular men with no shirt on dancing, and I said, "Why not?" So that's when I became a dancer. See, folks, and this is why you should never fall into peer pressure. Sad, <laughs> sad, sad. <laughs> nonetheless, I'm I'm sure it was a fun fun time. Nonetheless, I'm guessing it was mostly uh, male avatars in that place. Uh, no, well, I. I apparently got kissed in game. That that doesn't answer my question. By a male lab- by a male avatar. <laughs> it was I so fig- awkward. <laughs> I figured as much. Get ready to see Jack on the grinder rep, ladies and gentlemen. I'm oh, kidding, I kid. Don't worry. <laughs> Actually, is it don't worry? Don't worry. Don't worry. He's he's t- he's taking the easy gentleman. He's taken. But with that, what with that said, so for for this week, again we got our. Uh, two two major discussions along with a uh, a good portion of of news to cover. Uh, Jack, want to highlight what 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 will be our two big topics for this this week's podcast? All right. So for my side, my big topic is actually going to be on Epic Games. I uh, don't really want to say too much about it just because I want to keep you in suspense. And yes, and I also want to kind of. Uh, Jarrell Jack's head on this because I am pretty ambivalent to that whole um deb- debacle. So I'm gonna be playing a lot of devil's advocate here, most likely. And as far as my end, I'm gonna have a bit discussion on on how folks folks on how on how exactly again Marvel com- comics is how they're always failing. And it come, and it comes to us when, and it comes to us when one of their 
Mm-hmm. Admittedly, their diversity hires kind of steps forward and shines some light on his time with Marvel. Oh, and that will be, and that will lead to a bigger dis- discussion along that along that way. But for now, a little small news. Jack, 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 have you ever uh, seen the original Teen Titans show all the way back in 03? Oh, yes, those were my favorite ones. I love the original Teen Titans animations. I remember loving them. I have not watched, I have not watched the original cartoon in ages, so I don't know how well they've, they've hold up, but I, what I do now is that made me a big fan. However... I, w- I w- only had one pet peeve of that show when I was a kid, and that was, where the heck was Batman? Hey, it's Teen Titans, so it's about the teens, not the Titans. I still want, I still want a <laughs> Batman, dang it. Even as a little kid, I wanted, I wanted Batman. But nonetheless, it's a great sh- it's, it was a great show nonetheless, and of course, many years later, the show was then rebooted to Teen Titans Go, which... Um, at the very, at the very least, it ha- it has its own audience. It has its audience. I saw the show sometimes is clever for me, but most of the time it's pretty. Uh, uh, it gets pretty, in- it gets pretty annoying, at least for my point of view. Uh, Jack, do you have any personal thoughts on T Titans Go? No, don't get me started on it. Don't, don't. Enough said. Well, so, so for those who may or may not know. I believe last year, Teen Titans Go had a had a theatrical film that came out, and and after the film, like all superhero movies, there's an after credit scene which showcase that the that the original Teen Titans team will be returning. Now, of course, I assume many people assume that all oh, that the show itself will be returning, but it seems that is not really the case, at least for right now. For on. On June 26, the trailer for Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans dropped. And I have already seen the trailer. Jack, have you seen the trailer? No, this was actually the first thing I've heard about it. Um, I I, I did see clips and rumors about the whole reboot coming back, or like the whole, the original Teen Titans coming back. But I did not know that it was just going to be a versus type of thing. There. Yo, this is a very long Pause, my dude. Oh, sorry about that. I ac- accidentally muted myself. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I mean, this was like just the weirdest long pause. I'm like, should I keep going? I don't know. <laughs> well, well, for the honest right here, ha- a little edit has been made here. Don't worry, nothing, nothing has been lost. But I was, what I, but as I was saying, that. Actually, Jack, what uh, what is the last thing you heard me say? Uh, my thoughts about the whole thing, or if I knew. Oh, okay, so, so okay, so, so I was gonna, so I was gonna con- conclude that it's gonna be an animated, uh, an animate DC animated movie. So we have a home, it will have a home, re- a home, re- home release, and f- just from the trailer itself, there is no concrete date of when actually the sh- when actually it will, it will arrive uh let me just do a little double check and yeah no so no so nothing's from i can see where it will actually release but i imagine it'll probably be sometime this year so yeah i may or may not ch- may check it out get maybe give it a rental just just to see how it is because as much as all my tea times go, I have seen this concept done before, and it was actually done really well. It's uh, and this goes and it relates to if you're a huge Ninja Turtles fan, as I was, you regard the Turtles Forever, which did a similar thing, which, when which uh, two versions of the Turtles met together into one big, uh, cool crossover. Um, Jack, are you familiar with that at all? Um, you're talking about the ones where it was like the 
the 2005 run, 5-1, right? Uh, 2003, I believe. So, so it came around the same time around as the Teen Titans. Oh, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is so hopefully it's up to that good of quality and that good of, of fan service. I know I certainly enjoyed Turtles Forever when it came out. Hopefully the t- this Teen Titans um, crossover is just is just as good, and hopefully they uh they might step up the humor a bit for the Teen Titans Go side. And with that and with that said, keeping keeping on with the whole television stuff, two, hear me, two video game related shows have been have been an, have been announced of popular ga- of popular games from the east and the west in regards to the west on the USA new USA network there will be a pilot for a potential series based uh, called based called Masters of Doom pretty much it's a series is it is a pilot successful it will be a series series based based on the novel said name in which it highlights the the history and development of what came of the history and development of the original Doom game all those years ago, and honestly, actually that'd be something uh, worth getting into because if if any of you ever looked into how Doom was made and all the things and all the things they went to get that game running, especially on that type of hardware, is actually so it's actually very interesting. You ever, you ever looked up looked upon uh upon that Jack? No, not really. But um, uh, you're talking about first of all the like the the first Doom, right? The very first Doom. That's correct. The very first Doom, not the uh 2016 game by Bethesda. No. All right. So no, I haven't really seen that. But just but just looking at the game itself, I mean, really, it is ahead of its. It was ahead of its time. And I'll t- and I'll tell you this, and I'll tell you this much. I think one of the cool things I remember learning was how, uh, while it it is a 3D game, it's technically a 2D game, and oh. you can, and you can, and audience, you can go look look more into details about about that upon yourselves because it goes into a lot of technical jargon which I do not know, but nonetheless very intriguing, and as well, and and as well, one thing I'll be, in, and as well. It just some it just a, it's an important part of the gaming culture, gaming history. So hopefully, the pilot does well, and the TV show is not only good, good and interesting, and that's all I can really say about that one. And as for the other TV news, uh, Jack, Final Fantasy will have in their own live action TV series, pro- uh, produced uh produced by Sony. Now at this at this moment, what we can only really know is that it's going to be an original story. Uh, set in the um, setting, uh, or at least I guess one of the settings of F F F fourteen, and as as far as any re- relevant details regarding the show itself, be- uh, besides besides uh, announces a certain uh, cr- uh, people working working on the show, um, there's not much to know what the show is actually going to be about or how. Will be available, or if there's something exclusively to Japan, which I hi- I highly doubt, considering that considering that at least in the recent years, a lot of uh, Final Final Fantasy uh, m- uh, movies tend to uh, tend to be available right here in the West. So, do you have any uh, personal thoughts about that uh, about that, Jack? Since you are, I guess, more heavily into Final Fantasy than I am. Yeah. Um. So. The thing with that, uh, at first, if you told me this like a a good while back, I would have been very happy and excited for this. But really, this I don't, I'm not sure because uh, I know one of my family members. He's also fairly big into Final Fantasy. He's also been talking about this rumor where exactly the same thing you said. There's gonna be another uh, Final Fantasy 14 based live action show or movie. The the first one we've seen was actually called Dad of Light. And the the tough thing, like I yes, the the move the 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 series is in Netflix right now, but it's actually very, very hard to see because of 
mostly how Netflix is run by algorithms and stuff. And how the only way I was able to see the dad of life was literally searching up online in the, in like kanji. You know how hard that is to search something up in kanji? Really? You got, you had that situation? Mine, in my case, the, there was pretty much being advertised when that show was available, um, on, on my Netflix. I don't know what's going on with yours. Oh, it could be also the same thing because of, uh, how my Netflix usually only contains CW shows, most likely. Okay, so, so, it, okay, so then going based on your, uh, watch history, that's most likely why it didn't, uh, kind of advertise to you? Yeah, but like, uh, in a way, this is just me saying how this could be a problem with most Americans out there because they either just watch things like Game of Thrones or some other popular Western show. And like, so having a new Final Fantasy show come out, it's not really that big of a, like a surprise for me because the data light was really Pop. It, it it came out, for me in my opinion it was pretty good. Well, but, but will you still watch this new FF show if if you're able to when when it eventually comes out? Hopefully. Well, that's all we can really say about that matter. Continuing on, uh, continu- uh, continuing on, still on, still coming on T TV. Uh, actually, our our uh, not our last TV news, but uh, but our last TV, but our clo- uh, to close off uh, TV news for n- for now, uh, there has it has been confirmed by I believe he is the was is he the showrunner? I want okay I'm gonna go with showrunner because uh, I'm because assu- I'm assuming that's what he is. Oh and I'm sorry no scratch that the uh, creator writer and executive producer of Arrow and DC Legends of Tomorrow. Sorry, co-creator Mark Guggenheim. He has confirmed that there's going to be another big CW D, uh, DC show event entitled Crisis on Infinite Earths. This, which isn't you know exactly titled as the original story of being back in the 1980s. I want to say. Now, I have not been keeping up at all with any of the CW, CW shows. So, uh, Jack, what are you your thoughts on on this matter? And is there anything you have seen so far? That has uh, led up to being that a big another crisis thing is gonna happen. Uh, right now, so I'm currently mostly watching the Flash. I've been watching the Arrow for a good amount, but uh, if I call it, kind of fallen off of it. And from just the Flash's uh show, I haven't seen anything really that's gonna lead up into the Infinite Crisis. Uh, I have seen the the Flash meet Batwoman finally for like the, the latest crossover event they had. I think it was called like Elseworld, right? That is correct. So uh, that one they did meet, like they got together with Supergirl, Arrow, and the Flash, and they all met up with Batwoman. And of course, right now. We don't have a Batwoman show, but it's going to be coming out shortly. And if I remember correctly with the Batwoman show, just to give people out there what it's going to be about. Batwoman is the cousin of Batman, of Bruce Wayne. And she comes, she comes to Gotham to, if I'm correct, just to see why his cousin went missing so why did batman went missing in gotham but uh, so far from there i can't tell anything about the infinite crisis well all well from my from my view there is from my view I, from my view as someone who's more in, in, into the comics i can i guess give you an idea what's going to be so uh, jack so, for the original Crisis on Infinite Earths, have you ever, uh, at least, uh, do you know vaguely enough about uh, about that original story? Uh, no, no. Okay, so the original the original story, what it was, 
was DC uh, combining all the multiverses that they had at the at the time, which, or in other words, kind of like all the different properties that DC of ha, had purchased throughout all throughout all the uh, years that they were a company. Pretty much combining them all together in one big event, and then from there, uh, pretty much starting over and having a clean slate. And now in this case. And then this story involved everyone within the D- the DC the DC universe, from your heavy hitters to your um, C tier characters. Now, my guess is, my my guess is for this um, uh, pseudo I guess say pseudo adaptation of Crisis Infinite Earths for the uh, CW uh, the CW verse, I do know for a fact that. I believe Arrow is going to go into its final season, if I'm if I remember I heard that news recently. So, what could be is that this big event will pretty much kind of obviously lead to a big, huge crisis in which all the heroes from each of the CW shows will come together. And by the end, pretty much everything is going to reset and I and that will then give the incentive for CW to continue on these shows probably with um uh, New versions of of their star characters. Hmm, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's a, that's at least my that's how that's what I think at the moment. At being it as is, they're kind of loosely adapting this story. It could be just another big popular event just to boost up, uh, boost to boost up their their shows and or oh, and. And pro- and probably be a way to uh give ba- give bat uh, give Batwoman a uh better a better chance is as in succeeding, so that's really all all I can give you on on that news. So hopefully Jack, when eventually this uh, little crossover comes up, you let me know how it is, because I I if I recall correctly, you did enjoy the Elseworlds little um event, right? It was it was good. In a way, yeah, it was kind of good, yeah. I had to, like, of course I had to go through the hassle of finding the right, like, the right, the, uh, how you say? The right episodes? The right order. The right order, yeah, the right order of episodes. <laughs> uh, just just like the comics. Pick, pick up an issue, character, pretty Pick up an issue, finish reading the story, and the bottom corner says, "Check, uh, the story continues on Amazing Spider-Man number two seventeen. But I was reading Iron Man. Well, too bad. Well, too bad because the third part of the story is going to be the next issue of Iron Man. <laughs> and like some people might think that, well, well, you're watching all of them, aren't you? Because then that means you have a at least a basis on which what's the order for this certain thing. And for me, I. Again, I only currently watch more of the Flash. The Arrow, it kind of kind of fell off. Supergirl, I gave it the good old college try, probably even more than that. I mean, I seriously gave that like a whole season to impress uh, me. And more like he gave the community college try. Hey, hey, no, hey, I gave that show a season, a season. That was a season and a half. Even worse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If if um for those who are not aware of the kind of uh, I know other word to put it, kind of the stigma about Supergirl. Actually, there's actually a video. Um, I would rec- recommend looking up if you want to look more into into that. Uh, there is a video by a YouTuber named uh, Young Ripa, and he he's he's another um uh co- comic related channel, but he also dives into um. Uh, po- uh, po- politics and some and some pop culture and mu- and music, and he has and one of his big videos, his whole Senji kind of t- big old rant on soup on Supergirl. So I would recommend uh lo- uh looking for that up if you want if you really want to get a more proper view of what super uh what the Supergirl show entails. So and with that out of the way, and with that with that out of the way, let me go to. Ex- let me go. We're gonna we're gonna be coming into our big story soon, but a little. I want to get everyone to know. I want to get everyone to 
to hear this, uh, DC will be announcing a new series called... I'm sorry, not DC, DC Comics. They'll be announcing a new comic series called The Last God, which is going to be a horror fantasy, which you don't you don't really see often. And Jack, hope you're looking, and I hope you're looking this up because the art alone, my God, they're pulling that is that is some good art. What was it called again? Like, I, the Last God. It's going to be a new series for DC's Black Label, and right and right and there is a, a quick synopsis of what this uh, what about what the story is so and here is the and here is the synopsis by the head writer himself uh, Philip Kennedy jo- uh, Johnson he's he says this is a terrifying horror story told in a stunning epic fantasy world set in two different generations it follows a mighty fellowship of heroes that travels beyond the borders of creation to kill a god and the next generation and the next generation who learn their predecessors aren't the heroes the world believes them to be. So, and let's see. So that's so, so far what we got. Um, what what we got so far as the synopsis to the Last God. And oh look, there's oh look like a true fantasy story that have their own make believe map. Map. That's nice. That's nice. So, as to when will this uh, comic, uh, first issue of this comic will be re- releasing, it will, here we go, the first issue of The Last Cup will release on October 30th, 2019, actually very appropriate, being that it's a horror story, releasing the day before Halloween, so, good timing, DC, good timing, and that will be on the DC, uh, and, and it will be under the DC Black Label, so guys, uh, keep a lookout for that comic, that might be something worth purchasing down the road. And with the small, small news out of the way, let's go into our big story. Jack, why don't you um, take why don't you uh, take take the lead from here and 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 help us go through this whole e- uh, epic situation, shall shall you? All right, thank you. Uh, I was about to say thank you, Jack. Thank you, Hack. <laughs> Such a narcissist he is. <laughs> thank you, me. Uh, Anyways, so I've also been keeping mostly hack uh, kind of in the dark with this whole thing, just because I I don't want to. I have the tendency to kind of already discuss these things ahead of time before we even get this to the podcast. So just give I, I had to pen, I had to kind of hold that in for a good week. Oh, just let it out, man. Let let it out. Let the passion flow through you. Let the dark side flow through you. <laughs> so, with Epic Games. Now, everyone's already have heard that Epic Games is kind of... Well, mostly for the PC community. Everyone from the console, doesn't, they, don't, they don't care. For the PC community, Epic Games has been... Also, they have been an annoyance to us. Mostly because... Of the whole ex- exclusivity thing that they're doing. So in this article, it says here that Epic Games CEO says exclusives are the only strategy to shake up PC gaming status quo. Oh, and to and to cut and to interject, everyone, this is from the uh, pol- and this article comes from us from Polygon, just, just to um, uh, so, so that so just to cite the source. Continue on, Jack. All right. So first of all, uh, side note. Yes, I know it's Polygon. Yes, they're also, eh. But this one, they have everything that's supposed to be talking about this. So please, mostly the PC gamers, just hold out on the Polygon. It's it, they're talking for you this time. So, <laughs> so with the Epic Game Store, uh, Tim uh, Sweeney, Sweeney. Uh, call- and can you tell our audience who this Tim Sweeney is for uh, for background? All right. So first of all, okay, I think I said his name right. Tim Sweeney. He is actually the uh, CEO of Epic Games. So the CEO himself has been currently in his Twitter. It says here, we believe that there is no set of features with which Epic Games or any other store 
could add that will be so revolutionary revolutionary as to lead to a large scale move of gamers from a dominant store to a new to, to a new one. So it says here we believe the lock in effect of having a large library of games on a dominant storefront is more powerful than features, and hence a dominant store can only be challenged through exclusives. So basically, in lamest terms, what he's saying is the reason why Epic Games is making exclusives is because that's the only way to fight Steam's monopoly and this whole thing. Now, now, if, now, there's a lot to kind of go go in there. So I guess we'll sort of, I guess we'll I'll ask this I'll ask this first to you, Jack, so you can get your kind of put your thoughts in order. Now, do you one do you completely agree or ki- or completely disagree with that statement? So here's something that might surprise a lot of people, uh, mostly you, Hack. Uh, I actually do agree with Epic Games. Oh, I what a twist! Continue. So okay, for me, I am very adamant on how I hate that they do exclusives. They I mean, they take these developers away, and then it just causes a lot of drama. But it is true that, in a way, they can't really fight Steam by just being by just having the same the same things, like the same features. Because, as he says, why would you even want to leave Steam when you have like? There's some people out there with thousands of games in their library to go to Epic Games. That that is true, and and Jack yeah, can attest attest to that. Only saw a preview of his Steam library, and I and I want to say is I don't think he's even finished even twenty percent of the games he has bought over the years. I did not buy them. It was the humble bundle, okay. See even see even worse. Even the games he get at a at a bargain price, he still hasn't finished. Hey, that's messed up. <laughs> oh, it's like, only because only because it's true. Continue on though. But like, so here's the thing: I have, I've also had friends that I've talked to, where they were kind of discussing how they don't feel comfortable leaving. They 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 rather have all their games into one store, like into I mean, not one store, one library, and of course. You're not gonna, for example, you're not gonna, you have your full bookshelves of books, and then there's like, let's say, two or three slots in there. But then you buy another book, you're not gonna be like, hey, I'm gonna, or, I'm gonna just go into another, I'm just gonna buy another bookshelf and put that book there. They're most likely gonna want to put that book in their old bookshelf. I don't think using the bookshelf is, good, is. I don't think it's a good. I see where you're going with that argument. I don't think it's a good comparison because number one, you can run out of space on your bookshelf. You can run out of space in the uh, in the library too. But oh well. I did not know that actually. Well, I'm not sure about the Steam library, but in general. Okay. So okay. So now, what that statement now what that statement said up. Oh, that statement said. Do you now? I'll, I'll I'll say this. Steam is is it feels like it's a monopoly, but it's techni- but it's actually not. There are other um, game services out there. The only one I, uh, out there, they're just you know, it's not as big as Steam. The only ones I know that's uh, that comes to my mind as someone who's not a PC gamer will be a GOG. Although I believe that one, don't they? Aren't aren't they kind of like their whole thing is is kind of ha- um, their services being a way to play much older PC games on on modern um, on on mod- on modern P- PCs? Isn't that their whole uh, shtick? Or I, is that, am I wrong on that? I'm not really sure about GOG, but like the here here's the thing. Yes, technically Steam does not have a monopoly, but they're pretty much the big cat compared to the slums of all the other game launchers out there. Yep, and uh, nah, and I can relate to this because a similar thing is 
is, is the same thing with comics in terms of comic distribution, how there's technically not a monopoly on who on which comic companies choose which company to distribute their comics, but really all of them just pick one service because it's, it's the one that it's either A, the most either reliable, the most commonly used, and is the one that has pretty much the most capital. And I'm assuming I'll say they were steam that over the years they have gained a lot of capital in the PC market. Yeah, and like that's the thing that the the reason from what I've also heard is that Steam apparently has been falling down in users mostly because of how uh it's been I don't know, it's been relating a little bit to their summer sales event that they're doing right now. It's kind of not working well. It's kind of eh. Is there not like any as the like the the selections they choose for summer sales kind of been dwindling over the years? No, it's like the thing is that they're uh usually every time when there's a summer sale there will be like a mass spike of Steam users getting on because of course who doesn't want cheap games? I see, I see. So with and 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 I'm and I'm, I'm assuming based on what you said that there are spikes, but it's just not as big as spikes as it used to be, like, say, like, four years ago? Yeah, and they're kind of getting worried because, uh, of course, at first, Epic Games stealing... They first stole some indie developers. I mean, Steam was not going to care. They were indie developers. But now they're... not. I, oh, actually, I shouldn't say steal. They were pretty much gaining these. And... But now... Epic Games has been taking things like Borderlands 3. That's going to be an Epic Games exclusive. Oh, oh yeah. I forgot, I forgot about that. And then there was the the third Metro game, correct? Metro Exodus? Yes, yes. Yes. And and and, and recently Shenmue 3. Wow, a lot of 3s they've been getting. A lot of... <laughs> so if you just, want just your game that. to not be uh, taken by Epic Games, just make sure you don't put a 3 in there. I think I just figured it out. They're, they're, Epic Games been getting games start with a three. No. Steam is owned by Valve, and what is Valve all have always done? Have always oh, you know, no. wanted to do, but no. never done. No, please you, don't. You got it. No, That's please why. don't. No. Epic Games knows Valve's secret. They're getting all the number three games from. Steam only to put salt in the wound that there is no Half Life Three. <laughs> I th- I solved the case, Watson. I solved the case. <laughs> Epic Game is not buying all these games out of some kind of weird uh, competition in order to gain new users. No, no, they're doing this. They're doing it to spite Steam because the people at Epic, they want to see Half-Life 3, so they figured, why not hurt their market so that they'll be forced to make Half-Life 3? I just solved, every, <laughs> I just solved the problem, everyone. If you want Half-Life 3 to happen, get install the, the Epic Game Store launcher, buy against Epic Store, and that will guarantee you'll get Half-Life 3 in the near future. <laughs> okay, let's all put on, uh, take off our tinfoil hats right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that, that just that just came to me. All right, but but going but go, going back on track. So yeah, so Epic's been acquiring um get, uh much more uh big bigger titles um into into the library. So yeah. that's where we start off. Uh, yeah. Continue your thoughts, Jack. And then from there, the uh, it well, like the thing is that with this happening, I do see Tim Sweeney's uh point of view why they're going to do this. It gives them extra revenue to be able to eventually have their their features that they're lacking compared to Steam. And also it's going to have people build a library in Epic Games and their store so then eventually people will either have both Steam and Epic Games or will just uh, they'll just go to the Epic Games store. Now, and I, and I would ask, competition is always a good thing, especially in a, a free market economy like ours. Now, uh, Jack, let's do a little. Uh, let's say you're, let's say you're, you're the CEO of of Epic Games. You're, ten, you're, um, you're in Twin Cities shoes, and 
and and, you, and let's say you don't want to go the route of using the exclusive exclusivity um strategy, which has worked out very well for console games, but since this is PC, a much whole different beast entirely. What do you? What would you propose to make Epic Games a much to be much more attractive for uh P, for PC gamers? If you if you have any ideas. Um. So. The one thing that really does come to mind is, and this won't even work, that's the problem too, is also have, not have the exclusivity, but like, have the same games in your, like, sell on the Epic Games Store, but maybe add in some like, like a little thing where like, oh, if you bought it here, you get this nice little skin that comes with it that even then no one's gonna bother going to the epic game store if you get that unless if maybe you try to market to the hearts people and say hey we're really helping out the developers here we're doing an 80 12 split here compared to steam's 70 30 isn't that what epic games is doing though i mean i don't know if it's 80 i don't know if it's um Eight, eight um eighty twenty uh I should correct eighty twenty, but aren't oh, developers who go to Epic gain a bigger um gain gain a bigger cut? Sorry, it was eighty eight twelve. Sorry. Oh, okay. But uh, yes. but the but the thing is that I really don't see any way for Epic Games to to do this without the exclusivities. That's the problem. Hmm. Yeah, and the an idea that you proposed again, you said you said most likely when at work, it has been done on consoles. I remember I think near when it lost the PS4. I don't know if it was I don't know which COD Good Duty game it was. I don't know if it was Ghost or Black Ops. It was one of the one of the CODs on PS4, but um, there was number number one. There was all this big marketing of how that the game was going to be first coming on to PS4 before Xbox One. And I believe there was also going to be DLC available first for the PS4, then on Xbox One. And I'm not I'm not aware of it if it, if that actually led to any bigger success. I will say though that that re- that recently they haven't done anything like that again. So I'm guessing that it wasn't much that whatever success it may attribute to that it wasn't much for them to keep doing that. So. Yeah, so there's like kind of a real, a real example of your um, idea, Jack. And here's the thing, Hack. Here's the the thing. So, on that same uh, tweet that Tim Sweeney did about the whole where it says we believe the lock-in effect. So, what the lock-in effect is, judging by what he sent in this art, he he sent an article, also in that same tweet. That shows where it says on this article, this is from The Verge, it says, Bill Gates says his greatest mistake ever was Microsoft losing to Android. And this is talking about the phones. And Bill Gates, well, he's correct. Have you ever seen anyone say, have you any, have you ever seen anyone proudly say, hey, look at me, I have a Windows phone. No, but I've only seen one person in my entire life actually ever owning a Windows phone. And that's the thing. And it like right here it says if I can find it, where it didn't really matter how many features they had. Let me just make sure I'm not ad living here. Okay, I probably am ad living, but the thing is it didn't matter how many features that the the Microsoft Windows phone had. Android was still winning. Yeah, because they they were early on in getting the um the, the especially their their audience within the um, phone market, which is a huge audience. Yeah, it says here Android ultimately killed Windows Mobile and Windows Phone off, and it became the Windows equi- equivalent in the mobile world. Gates' admission is somewhat surprising, though. Many had assumed that Microsoft missed. Mobile opportunity was a just a mistake, uh, like an era mistake, because of a certain person. Now, and 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 all these issues go back to 
you know, you know, not as good as ever, but it goes back to Steam and how much of a jugger, juggernaut that that has become. Now, Jack, do you speculate that that Steam is eventually going to have a a big fall in the near future because of how essentially of well, not technically being a, uh, a monopoly within the um, the U.S. within the uh, U.S. business law, do you be eventually that's going to uh, uh, lead lead to Steam's ultimate ultimate downfall? Well, here's the thing. I don't. For me personally, I don't think that Steam is gonna fall off like to oblivion or anything like that. It's gonna it's gonna lose popularity. I feel like uh like how some I heard this one person say that at first people didn't really like Steam and eventually after a few years they started liking it. I mean like see how Steam it is now apparently people do like the game or the game like Steam. I feel like that's going to be the same way with Epic Games. They're going to there's people going to be out there that's going to hate it right now. I mean I'm personally the person that doesn't really like what Epic Games is doing, but it is a an evil that they have to do to actually gain a foothold in this whole market against Steam. Yeah, yeah, the necessary evil, as it is called. Now, now, I, now, of course, and of course, you know, and of and of course. Hopefully this this doesn't lead to uh, uh, if you don't mind me, Jack. This is going to only some well, at least a little political. Hopefully this is, doesn't come into when any form of, of uh, government regulation in the PC market because then that will just cause even more problems. Oh, that would uh, be it, so bad if they have that added in. Yeah, I mean it's all it's already a. It's already it's already a a slippery soap slippery soap when when it comes to the government interfering in loot in loot boxes. I mean, call it gambling, call it um a type of gambling on you want. As soon as kind of the government wants to step into that into that little problem, it's gonna turn into even a, a bigger problem. I mean, just look at the um uh just look at the casino industry within the U.S. Nonetheless, hopefully it never comes to that, and then. And then it becomes a whole entirely uh, political political issue with regards to that. So hopefully, the uh, what was that called? The in was that the invisible hand, the free market? I think that's what it's, I think that's oh, what it's yeah, called. Yeah. The, yeah, the invisible hopefully, hand of the free market. Hopefully, the invisible hand of free market will kind of uh, solve this um this issue we have at least within PC within PC gaming because. As much as I don't uh, play on PC, play on PC as someone who's a console gamer, I obviously do see the entire like positives that playing on PC has over over console. And it would be a shame that by the time I finally um, get into PC, that it, it that it's in shambles and not much people are using it. So, and all and all due to whatever outside influences or whatever mm-hmm. poor decisions Valve or Epic make in the future. And currently now, going from this whole thing, I'm going to now transition over Hacked into some more things about Epic Games and what's happening with them right now. So, um, let me just ask you, of course, are you a fan of Shenmue? Do I like women? And... um, have you seen what? Have you seen Shenmue Three at all? Correct. Uh, I am a I'm, I'm a personal backer of the game, so I have seen what can be seen of that game since it since it was first announced like four years ago. Yes, and now I knew how excited you were, and I'm also personally I was also personally excited for Shenmue Three even being announced. Mm-hmm. So to relate this to Epic Games, um. Epic Games has really been, I don't know, they've been kind of like a chaotic neutral in this whole thing. Epic Games will be covering, or they'll be doing refunds for to the unhappy Shenmue 3 backers. 
yeah, I actually saw that um in the in a Kickstarter update what was I think a few days ago on my email and I was like, Oh and I and I and I already knew that we'll be discussing that on the podcast. Uh continue, Jack. But yeah, the Epic Games surprisingly is re they're refunding the money to those that were promised a PC version of the game. And the thing is that for me personally, they have uh, the they have a good reason why their money needs to be refunded. Throughout the whole Epic, I mean not throughout the whole Epic Games, but throughout the whole Kickstarter, their list always implied and also sh- uh, shows Steam related things, like saying there's gonna be Steam keys. The first trailer had a Steam logo on it. Hell, even Steam has a, a page for Shenmue. So the whole thing with them, uh, with the backers being angry during the E3 release that says it was going to be an Epic Games exclusive, there is a lot of unhappy backers. And of course, this kind of gives me hope because it's, this was a, a crowdfunded game. All, most of the money was crowdfunded. So at least they were, at least the the company kind of realized that the game wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the backers. Yes, yes, indeed. I also want to uh, highlight something else because I do have the email because I do have the e- the email when that um uh, when the original announcement came in. Uh, give me a moment to find it. Shouldn't Take me long. Do, 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 do. No, that's for that anime de- uh, anime Blu-ray I backed, which I'm still waiting on. <laughs> freaking, freaking waiting for the original creator to finish that four-page manga. My buddy, and sign up for them. Anyways, <laughs> okay. So sh- ah, here, wait, here, here it is. Okay. So one of the things I also want to kind of highlight and uh, hi- highlight is that if you are a ba- if you are a backer. Um, you can switch on um, which um, platform that you want the ge- that you want uh, the game the game on, and let's see. I was trying to see if I read it here. Uh, did... okay. Wait. Okay. No. So. So. You can, so yeah, as as I said, you can switch which platforms you you want to have it on, and also for some reason they also have a um, you can get a physical version of the of the PC of the of the PC PC version of uh, Shenmue Three, which which is interesting. When was the last uh, Jack? When was the last time you had to you bought a PC game a PC game and had to install it via disc? Uh. I have not had to do that in forever, really. I think the last time I actually installed a game, I, the last time I had to install a game was around World of Warcraft, pretty much. And would, and would you say that? And that was like, I think, yeah, that was like the third, the second or third expansion. Was that the Lynch, Lynch King one? I'm assuming so. Well, either case, yeah, that was a long time ago. So I'm actually surprised that that is an option. And and specific, it says uh, PC physical. So you get the so you get the disc plus an Epic Game Store key. So hopefully, so it doesn't. S- uh oh, and also it says. Is select either the PC physical or PC digital version. An option to also receive a Steam key one year later will be available. Backer must manually select this option in the survey to receive the Steam key. So, um, if you don't want if you don't want to refund your refund your game, you still want to play on the Steam. Uh, if you you go take the survey and put in the option that you still want the uh, Steam key for the game when it arrives a year a year later. But I'm actually hoping that, because I can't really give any info whether or not the actual phys- physical 
PC disk is is separate from the key, and so you, and so it doesn't. It's not like a thing where you kind of where the disk all it is is just kind of installs the game and you have to need Epic just to play it. Hopefully that's not the case. I mean, as far as I know, believe way back then you put the disk in, close CD drive. Ask you to install, install, boom. I don't think it let anything be like like you have to use this launcher in order to play this game with that which is which you're physically installing. But whatever. I think whatever. it's actually gonna be just like as you said. Because um if I was correct, you had to for World of Warcraft you had to install the C D and then once when you waited for it to install you have to log in still. Like, actually go into the launcher and log in. All it did was really transfer the files into your PC. Well, there you go. See, this is why I have Jack around, because he knows this stuff more than I do, so... But, well, never mind. Either select that option for the survey to still reach the Steam key, or, hey, go ahead, get your get your refund. Hopefully, hopefully you didn't spend the amount of money to get that d dinner with the creator, which I wonder if it actually... I think that happened. I think someone was crazy enough to to buy like one of the higher tier awards where they got to have dinner with the creator of Shinmo. Must must have been odd if, if there has to be a translator there. <laughs> I, I wonder how bad that person must have felt or how betrayed he must have felt if he was a a person that bought the Steam key for the game. Uh He's probably ripping. He's probably he's probably deleting that fo that that photo with the creator at, um, as we speak, or probably already has already done so since the story since when when the story came out. He's probably committing Sudoku right now. Mm. No, he's committing Sudoku on the creator because <laughs> because the creator did did something with no honor, did a, <laughs> a dishonorable change. But with that, any any last thoughts on the. On this whole epic thing as a whole, Jack, before we move on? No, no. I think I pretty much ranted my way out of this already. And with and with that said, move on to our second discussion. It's now my turn to take the helms. And we go back to my room of comics and Jack, I want you I want here here, I want you hear a bit of wisdom. Ready? But Jack, if you ever if you ever own a start owning a business or you ever Put yourself in a situation where you gotta hire someone. Remember, remember this. Remember this. That hiring someone ba based based on arbitrary things like race, creed, or e or even or sexual orientation is going to ruin your company and ruin your company in the long run. Or as the internet likes, or as the internet likes to call it, get woke, go broke. <laughs> and in this case, Marvel, for the past, I want to say, four, four, de debatably maybe five years, have been on that tr have been on that train ever since, e ever since the initiative, ever since the initiative to take establish uh, take established heroes and and change them up, such as Miles Morales, Spider Man. Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, uh, Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, and a and a lot and a lot more. Now, it has all come to it has all come to this recently when a now former writer of Marvel, a man named Cena, man a man named Cena Grace, very op openly gay, it is re relevant to this, where he where where he finally speaks out about his experience with Marvel and how much they were putting him down and how Marvel did not treat his did not treat his writing well and how he felt like such a diversity hire. And now Jack initially I was like, you know what? Maybe this guy has maybe this guy has a point. Maybe you know, he he, he really was some maybe he really was someone who didn't have much talent and really was just hired to be gay. Unfortunately, the thing is uh, with this writer, Cena Grace, he actually does have a lot of comics experience. Uh, since 2001, I want to say, uh, he has been a an editor for many different comic series uh, throughout his uh, throughout his most of his career. And one of the bigger series he has edited for would be The Walking Dead. 
So he certainly ha definitely has experience, the ex experience and, and some t and some talent, and and once he came to Marvel, that's where he really start started his whole writing career. Now here's the now here's the thing, here's the thing, Jack. I will give Cena Grace uh, this credit, and that he was given he was given a story that already was a that already had a bunch of red flags. Um, are you aware of the whole uh, gay Iceman thing? I was not really aware of that. Well, yeah. So in in the current continuity now, uh, Iceman has gay, thanks to a younger Jean Grey, not the present Jean Grey. I'm sorry, not Jean Grey, not the present <laughs> Jean Grey, a younger version of her that somehow is still in the current timeline. She she kind <laughs> unlocked a portion of. Of Bo uh, Bobby's brain that kind of re revealed that he was gay all along, which doesn't make any sense because uh, any X Men f long time X Men fan will tell you that well Bobby has has a lot of love interest throughout the years and to trying to say, to trying to say he was gay is more than just a is more than just a stretch. Bisexual, uh, you could work with that, but gay. You know, there's a lot of tons of evidence that prove contrary. But nonetheless, Marvel wanted a, wanted a gay hero. Instead of creating one, they figure, why not? Take the one of the gayer-looking X-Men, make them gay. And so, Cena Grace was given that assignment. Now, here's the thing, Jack. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Alright, the bat, the comics are terrible. They're terrible in the fact that, num number one... That Iceman is never is is he is written very very selfish, um, very um, uh, very un very very uncaring, very unhero very unheroic, and 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 last and lastly, and and lastly, the only real th and then lastly, everything always the comic series only around about his homosexuality. If you bought Iceman expecting, all right, maybe Iceman goes on his own adventures, and you you can have the gay element in there, but it's more about you know good old fun with Iceman. Nope, every all every single issue have to revolve around that Bobby is gay. Does that sound like a fun? Does that sound like fun in general? It you sounds know? pretty boring to me. Oof, see, I wish it was boring because then there'd be nothing to complain about. Any case, so. <laughs> Now, I want to also keep in mind that Cena Grace, he was giving, he, he in his little tum, tum, Tumblr, Tumblr, blah, I hate the name of the website, Tumblr page, he, uh, he would often say of how, <clears throat> excuse me, he, op he often say that, that if Marvel gave him the chance that he could have written the great Iceman book that, that he envisioned, here's the problem, Jack. Mm -hmm. Marvel did give him chances, many chances. He did a his first series, with what well, was his first big break, did not sell well, was canceled. Then he got a then he got another chance by making a one shot comic, pretty much just a one issue story. He did that, still wasn't still wasn't good. And then when leadership changed within Marvel, they got a new editor in chief. He got then on his third chance to make another Iceman series, not a, not a one issue comic, another series, and he still screwed it up. How do you screw up three times like that? I don't know. That is that is, if any talent he has, that's the talent right there. How do you screw up so many opportunities that way? And the problem is, the problem is, he's so far up his rear end that he can't acknowledge number one any of the criticisms given to him for his books. He pretty much f feels like Marvel's done him wrong when they have actually he he's given them a lot more chances than even one of their more veteran writers. Heck, you know if in the comic bit in the comic business, you know unless you're playing for a certain politics, you're not giving many chances to even write a freaking. School. Not even Squirrel Girl comic. He was reading Iceman. Iceman ain't no bottom tier character. He's a number one. He's a he's a fur, he's a veteran X Men. Been there since day one. You know many pe even v many people know who I 
or at least know who Ice Man Ice Man is from the movies, and even if you play um uh, some of the video games, he's always a main character, especially in the X Men games. And so now he's given this big character. He messes it up three times, and he still has the galls to say that wasn't my fault. No, it was Marvel. They were keep they were keeping him down apparently. That seems to be the problem with a lot of these type of writers, quotes unquote, air quotes there. Uh, they they really don't like to actually own up to their mistakes or own up to anything really. And like it, it really does damage whatever they do. So, like how how you said, it really did damage Iceman as a character, mostly because of how he was writing Iceman. And to do this to like as you said, a veteran X Men. Sure, I don't really read the comics or anything, but that does kind of sound sad. It's like as if they ruined Batman for me. Can you repeat that last statement? You cut, you cut off there on my mic. Oh, I'm sorry, on my headphones. Can you repeat that last statement? How dare you make me repeat myself. <laughs> but, uh, as I said before, um, hold on. So, like, as I was saying, that doing this to a veteran X-Men, like as you said, to Iceman, kind of messing up his character, not just because Oh, they making him gay, but just really, they're met. The guy was messing him up constantly with the three series and nothing. Yep. It's like and... it's like for me if I was if I got my uh Batman messed if someone messed Batman with for me. Oh yeah, I'm done. Uh, all right then. <laughs> well, Sorry. it's all right now. I want to, now, of course. I I, I don't want now. I want you to kind of cite some of the things he said in this Tumblr post. In this Tumblr post, and kind of him not seeing things for what for what they are. Here's like, uh, for example, here's one. Again, these books are are not good by any means necessary. I don't care what your politics politics is, or any of you're gay or not. If you read those Iceman books, they're not even worth the, the three the three the four dollars that they're priced on here. To um, and to quote kind of his disillusions, uh, here's something that he uh, he typed. You may be asking if my Iceman book was any good, or if I'm just being sour grapes over a bad work experience. Believe me, I asked that too. From the get-go, my first editor asserted that Iceman will be dead on arrival if it were too gay, quote unquote, while also telling me to prepare for a cancellation anyway, given that most solo X Men titles, <clears throat> excuse me. Don't last beyond a year. Never mind that my work on Iceman had gotten positive press in the New York Times in print, or that in spite of critical sandbagging, the Siri Nets glowing reviews on Amazon. Now here's the thing. On the surface, that doesn't sound much, but he, he but you hear you hear that? You hear the feedback he's been getting he's been getting? It's not from fans. It's from a big newspaper. And Amazon reviews. That's kind of funny because, like, it's you, th 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 does that sound like feedback directly from like people who read these Exxon books for a long time? And and like that's a problem with a lot of just people in general. What they when they do something like business related or anything close to that is that they look at the numbers, but they they. For example, like how there be uh, some kind of activistic group, then they complain about, let's say, a video game. Like, oh no, the game needs more diversity, needs more gay people in there, or needs more black people, needs more Asians, needs more whatever. Just put in everything. The, the company will, of course, bend the knee. They'll do what they ask. And the funny thing is, those activists, they weren't really going to buy your game, even if you put in the diversity. They just wanted to, they just wanted that to happen. And all you li all you left is the audience, the actual audience that bought the game or bought the comic, whatever media they had, very upset because then they're now thinking this is not what I I subscribed to. This is not what I signed up for. 
That is a, that is a good point, Jack. And and there's also something that that he's uh, that he's also written within the same um, paragraph that I just finished reading. He uh, he he then continues to say continue to say. <clears throat> Or, uh, what Marvel should have done is assign me a special projects editor. They should have worked within the specialty PR firm rather than repeat a tiresome cycle, treating the book like a square peg and getting confused when it's ahead. So pretty much, he's like, why doesn't Marvel should have given me special uh, special work conditions and the book would actually be a success? Does that sound like anything uh, reflecting on on your on your actual uh, work? Not at all. Really? No, no. Even if he get this, you know, special special work conditions, the book is gonna probably even will probably be just as crappy. <laughs> Shots fired. Yep. And and look, and and look to give the guy credit and many other, um, even uh comic fan comic fans have said this that it's not that the guy has no talent. He def he definitely. Uh, can can write when he's not very limited to what he can write, and being that he was he was uh his assignment was to write pretty much like um a gay ice man rather than just ice man, he probably put into that little mindset of okay I just have to just focus on that stuff rather than the super heroics that a superhero book wouldn't tell. But also, but I want to highlight another person who. Again, another diversity, another diversity hire. And you want to know, Jack? Want to know uh, what diver- what specialty diversity diversity of hire this this next person is? You want to know? Who is it? Please tell me, Hack. He he is hired because he's Muslim. Ooh. Yep, Mr. Saladin, Mr. Saladin Ahmed. I'm kidding. I don't know if it's actually that's pronounced like that, but I'll say Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of respect. I like Ahmed better though. Any case, now with Salin Salin Ahmed, his main lines work on Marvel, which it has been surprise surprise, uh, Miss Marvel. Now he did not originally uh, start the start the the book, but he has uh, has been one of one of the current writers uh, writing Miss Marvel. Now I could say more about his work within that book, but s- sincerely. From what I from from what I've ever heard is just that there's nothing much to say about Miss Marvel comics. You know, it, it's it, okay. I want to I want to plug in another uh, another YouTube another video here, guys. If you really want to see kind of like the fundamental problems with Miss Marvel, I recommend going to YouTube and look and typing up and and look and going to I'm sorry, going to YouTube and look up a video by a channel called um, Literacy Devil. I believe I'm pronouncing I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I know the word literature and the devil is in it, so I know I'm very positive on that. (laughs) Let me just confirm Yes. Uh, not literacy devil, literature devil. And one of his most popular videos is is entitled um, is is Comics Gate wrong? And now I'm not gonna go into what Comics Gate is. It's not important to what, not important to our discussion at the moment. But in this video, you know what he does? He does Jack. You know what he does? He he compares and contrasts Miss Marvel, who is specifically designed to be the Muslim superhero, and he decides, you know what? All right, let's compare this character to another Marvel character. Who is notable for his faith as a as a part of his uh, stories, and and I never heard anything of such thing. And well, and well, Jack, do you know what he compares Miss Marvel to in, in that regard, in terms of religious superheroes? What does he compare it to? Daredevil. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Yes, and he. And he takes the very first issue of Miss Marvel and compares it with the very first issue of Daredevil, and I, t- that, and I tell you that what that comic opens your eyes a l- that video I'm sorry opens your eyes a lot about what is wrong with the current writing and storytelling of Marvel comics today, and so 
I recommend everyone to go check it out. It is by the channel Literature Devil, Literature Devil, and it's called "Is Comet Skates Wrong Countering Counter?" I'm sorry. It's called "Is Comet Skates Comet Skate Wrong Part One." So I would recommend looking looking into that. But going back to original thing thing I was gonna say about uh, this side and Ahmed is that again he's another diversity hire who does not make big sales within his books. He's been given special you know, comics here and there. He wrote a Spider-Man comic one time. I think it was an annual issue. And so, and pretty much he's like a, he's a, a below average talent. And But for some reason, Marvel, with the bright idea of the size to use him as a way to bring back the ultimate universe. Ah, oh, the frustration. One of the most important multiverses within Marvel. And they're gonna and they're gonna you and they're gonna use a guy who once tweet, tweeted how he how he's annoyed by all the white people in Christmas time. He literally t- uh, tweeted something like that. What? Oh, okay. Why? I, Just I leave them I, I, leave them white people alone. Jesus Christ. Here's the tweet, guys. Here's the tweet. On December 13, 2017, Salida Ahmed tweeted, Can we please not have any more commercials with white people doing impossibly precious Christmas things for each other? The, this effing marionettes commercial makes me want to strangle someone. Jesus. Yeah, so this guy's also kind of not right in the head, especially if you were to replace white people with any other ethnicity... He would be out of the job faster than faster than you can faster than you can say uh, faster than a speeding bullet. And this just says a lot. This just tells you something that's very important. Racism yeah. goes both ways. Yeah, and Marvel's getting this guy to bring back a one of the most in, important uh, p- important parts of Marvel during during the early two thousands. Yeah, that sounds like a great move. Now, now at this mo- at this moment, there's only a, just been it's just an announcement, and it's gonna be coming in in, Ma- in Miles Morales' Spider-Man book in issue ten. But still, though, to leave that huge of responsibility to a guy of that talent who's only ri- 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 who's only really written uh, books about Miles and Miss Marvel, two books that don't do well and are mediocre at best. And he's going to be in charge of bringing back an entire universe worth of characters. Well, that's kind of worrisome. In, at this point, I'm just I'm just waiting for the... I'm just going to... When it comes, I'm just going to wait for the, either the little thud it's going to be or the... Um, or the... Or the huge disaster it will entail, because because that's all I can see coming from this, either a big thud or a big disaster. But to kind of close this all off, kind of close this off. These type of hires that Marvel's doing, and even DC's doing, unfortunately, like just like I said, I mentioned with last week's discussion on DC Vertigo, Marvel keeps doing keeps doing this, and by that, and they keep doing this, and not even paying attention paying attention to either. Old, uh, pre. I'm sorry, not old. Previous writers and previous writers who have done well for them in the past and not rehiring them, or looking for new, genuine talent. Instead, they go for they go out to people who either fit fit in a quota, or they're not even involved in comics at all. Damn. Well, I mean, um, yeah, I got nothing. I really don't. Get, I I can't defend that. No, not really, but uh, since we are kind of extending this quite a bit, I do want to transition to our last little bit, just uh, to give a a small recap of what's happening now. So remember, hack. Remember last time we had the the topic about the unethic the ethical departments for both Sony and uh, Squ- Square Enix. Square Enix, yes. Yes, I remember. Um... I remember, I remember. I remember. So, uh, just a little thing that happened recently, and you were the one technically that gave the idea because I was too scared to even mention it. Nintendo has also put in their two cents on the whole 
censorship thing. And can you give me more information of what they said? I will glad I will gladly. This, I'll tell you this, guys. This is one of the few moments where I feel legitimately some sort of pride of being someone who's been devoted to Nintendo since the GameCube. You know, as much as as limiting <laughs> as only Nintendo <laughs> consoles are, some sometimes felt, and I especially felt it during the PS3 360 era. Nintendo, you know, they can make dumb decisions, but sometimes. Once, where sometimes they'll make, they'll say something or do something that make you want to like stand up and just gamers rise up, hey gamers rise up, you know that whole thing. Now as to what they actually there, what they what they said. So this is so in regards to censorship in gaming, the let's see, uh, let's see where is I'm still trying to find the. Okay. Uh, so, so this comes from the Nintendo president Shuntaro Furukawa. So yeah, so they know nobody here, and he, and he says this: Nintendo as to third parties and their software applies for an objective rating from third party organizations prior to release. If platform holding companies choose arbitrarily the diversity and fairness in game software, the diversity and fairness in game software will be significantly inhibited. We provide parental controls that can be used to apply limits. So that's his full quote. Now, to kind of expand expand on that, what he's uh, kind of what the in between the lines saying is is that that the number one that censorship is going to lead to a dilution of ga- uh, of games which we uh, talked about in the pre- previous podcast in regards to game development and to a uh, player choice in regards to what games to get and he says to also to whatever type of little censorship things that that we have leave it to th- um the ratings board now again ratings board ain't perfect you know but he knows it's the best way we got to tell like if this game is suitable for children or not for children and also and also, that I want to highlight is that, is that if you use any modern Nintendo console, that they always find, they always include ways for parents to kind of control what their cho- children play, and so, so th- thus, thus Nintendo's kind of promoting the idea that hey, parents, if you don't want your kids to play these type of games, not only first of all you should uh, be the parent and establish. And establish the rules that your child must follow in regards to that and discipline. But we have but we have stuff within our systems to control that so, you're, so that your child, even if he attempts to uh, do something that he's not allowed to do, that they can't do it. So, and again, this is, and again, this involves more into, you know, again, more Nintendo's market, which is, which is mainly uh, families, uh, uh, families and children. But still, though, imagine just think about this, Jack. A fam, a Nintendo, a gaming company that's mostly centered around families and family entertainment has more better has a better position on censorship than such than Sony, in which they pretty much market their games to a much more mature audience. But they but they gotta step in and do the censorship themselves. Yeah, like that's the thing that for for me personally, I've been for the recent years, I've been loving Nintendo more and more. Uh, ever since the debut of the Switch, they've been getting increasingly popular, and especially with what they're saying now. And it's very refreshing to see that there's a company out there that's gonna be like, "Hey, we already have a we already have something that rates the games, the ESRB ratings." They do all that work about the, let's see what rating the game will be. They don't need to have an ethics department. All right. And, and as someone who's owned a Switch for like since when, uh, over coming up two years now, I can tell you, dude, like every week there's always a whole bunch of indie games coming out. And some indie games that look just like, I want to get that. I don't want to wait on PS. I don't want to play it on PS4 or on PC. I want to play that on the Switch. My God, there's so many good 
indie games, which I'm glad Nintendo was a kind of like a big supporter of having so much indie titles um, within their consoles, certainly more than Microsoft or Sony. Yeah, so um, any more thoughts on the Nintendo stuff right now? Ah, it's pretty much it's pretty much clear cl- clear it's clear and cut. So remember, so remember, folks, if you if you if you want to if you want to get that risk game game from Japan, don't get the PS4 version. And there's no PC version. There's probably a Switch version. Get the Switch one. You'll be more than happy with your purchase. That's just a little uh, announcement I have to say on that matter. So, and with that with that said, I believe. That ends our big discussion portion of, of the of the podcast, and we're gonna right now start doing our little uh, cl- uh, closing closing remarks. And of course, Jack, what Jack? Do you have any uh, music that you recommend for us uh, this week? Yep. And uh, so here's the thing: last week I had something more of a electronic. This time I'm gonna surprise people with something else that's. A little bit more from a different spectrum of the music genres. So this is for this is one song that I particularly love, and I always love playing the song itself. This is from Five Finger Death Punch. It is a metal band. So I'm not just an electrohead. I do like metal. I like a lot of things. And this song sorry. is yeah. No, I'm sorry. Keep going. This song is called I Refuse. This is in their... Let me just make sure which album this is in. This album is in the And Justice for None. Like N-O-N. Oh, N-O-E. N-O-N-E. I can't spell today. So yeah. So, just And Justice for None. It's called I Refuse. Awesome, awesome. I've heard of, I I've heard of Five Figure Death Death Punch. Um, well, there are reasons to them. Um, can you tell me what kind of what, what specific type of metal it is, if 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 you know? So specifically, this song is actually very. It's one of the more wider songs that they have in their whole album. The rest of the album, of course, is like metal. You have the of course, the double kicks and the the very heavy riffs in there, but this song is very, very calm. It's kind of very uh melancholy. Is it a ballad? Yes, and like the th- ah okay. And the thing is, uh, just like has my uh my girlfriend has said, since she's a really big fan of Five Finger Death Punch, the main singer, he can scream like a demon, but he sings like an angel. And what more can you ask for, ladies and gentlemen? So again, that's I I Refuse by Five Figure Dem Punch. And, and what album, Jack? It's called And Justice for None. Justice for None. Well, and also this week, I also have a music rec- recommendation. Now, now I, I will say this, Jack. I've actually been kind of been feeling a lot of blues lately. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting a little, little on the down. A little bit of a downer right now. But I've been listening to the blue the blues and again not a popular not a popular genre in 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 today's world of music but if you really want to get get your get yourself listen to something that's from a different time different style of playing really want to get that blues really want to feel the blues and a good way to start to start would be mm, here we go if you love me by BB King. I would recommend that. I would recommend that. I would recommend that song as a way to get you in into the blue. Because I'm just starting out. I don't know very too much about the genre as a whole. Besides, kind of historical. It's his historical importance. But again, that is "If You Love Me" by the great BB King. So that's my musical recommendation for the week. And with the end. Oh, and with that, I'll. I also would like to uh, say that to follow up, don't worry, Jack, we'll be up to you shortly. I'll, I'll keep this very brief because 
Because as a follow-up to last week's podcast, I actually did finish today reading the Ant-Man book that I um, got from the library, entitled Ant-Man, Giant Man, Growing Pains. It is a collection of specific stories regarding uh, Giant Man. So when um, so when Ant-Man finally st- starts to uh, turns turns big, it collects his f- very first appearance, along with well as a few uh, select select stories from the Avenger from the Avengers. Uh, overall, I actually really enjoyed it, and and uh, and just to keep, keep you in, just to keep you in mind. For this Ant Man, this is not the Ant Man from the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe. This is the original Ant Man, Doctor Henry Pym. Henry Pym. So it is not Scott Lang, the thief, the who is a thief. So that's all. Just want to clarify. And actually, uh, Jack, I want to highlight one one weird story in this collection. Mm-hmm. So the very first story you read. So this is the first appearance of Giant Man, and this is um, when Stan Lee was still um writing comics the very first story a kid you not okay so what happens is this is no story so i can spoil it what happens is aliens from another dimension come to earth to kidnap scientists who spe- who specialize in atomic in in atomic energy they come to kidnap them in, so that so they can force the the scientists to build them atomic bombs. Very weird. He, he, and Ant Man was one of the scientists that was chosen. Or, and here's the thing: the one question I thought to myself was, "Wait, these aliens can travel between dimensions, but they haven't figured out ato- uh, how atoms work." Magic. <sighs> I'll tell you, my old Marvel old comics just, just wow, just wow. It was a, it's a, it was still a fun story, but I just couldn't get over the fact that these advanced technological aliens did not know how to use atomic power. Well, it shows you that everyone has limitations. I guess, it's just so <laughs> weird. And the rest of the books are more your standard um super superhero. Uh, stupid superhero fair. It is actually a good, uh, good collection, and as also a good way to kind of go into uh, who Hank P- Hank Pym is as a person. Because I don't know, I no my little comic recommendation of the week. With that, with with that finish, uh, Jack, what are you looking forward to in the coming in the coming week? Where you what are you gonna be seeing? What you gonna be playing? What you gonna be watching? What is up? Alright, so for me, I'm going to keep this short. I'm still playing the Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers. Um, I'm already at level 80, so pretty much I am getting really close to the end of the expansion for now already. It's kind of sad, but yeah, that's that's my life right now. It, it's 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 alright. It's alright. Things have to come to an end. Um, is is that all you got more? No, that's pretty much it. I'm just going to be finishing up Final Fantasy XIV. All right, then. Um, as far as, uh, uh, as far as on my end, I'm going to be re, I'm going to be finally reading the Sandman comic from, from the DC Vertigo line of books. And this, and to, and this prompted up because this is a very smaller news. I couldn't really add in the beginning. But just to quickly mention this, is that the uh, the Sandman uh, comics are going to get a t- uh, are going to get a Netflix TV series in the coming future. So in a, in preparation for that, I'm going to start reading Sandman. I don't know what to I don't know what to really ex- expect. I will say, Jack, that I might be a show worth watching because Lucifer is an important character, like the Lucifer that you know from the Lucifer show. He is an important character in the Sandman comics. This is actually where he's from, so you might want. So that might be something of interest to you. And of course, and of course, as I said last week, I'm still going through uh, Fist of the North Star and Breath of and Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild. Although, admittedly, I haven't booted up Zelda at all this week, and I've only really uh, played like one session of Fizzle North Star, so I gotta put my butt back up on there. That, ladies and gentlemen, 
that comes the end of the second episode of the Hack Jack Show. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell so that you're notified when the next episode will be will be bringing up. And as and as well, if you like, if you would like to uh, follow us on any on any social media at the at the moment, you can follow me Hack at my Twitter Twitter account at Dandy at Dandy Spike. Again, that is at Dandy Spike. That is Hack's Twitter account. And with that, we bid you goodbye. So you say, say goodbye, Jack. Goodbye. Goodbye.